Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nelson Zade for this seminar series. Um, Nelson joined us in 2021 mm -hmm. from Cardiff University. He's been on this for many years. Pardon me, I didn't realize you going higher with the Institute of Engineering Environment. Uh, also associated with the Institute for Computational Data Science. Uh, his research group is always down the corner here. So I'll turn it over to Nelson. Okay, great. So anyway, I just want to thank those of you present here for coming and uh, those joining us online. I also want to say thank you for joining in. Uh, hopefully in the next few minutes to 40, as I said before, we catch up with some discussions. I just want to give you a flavor of the type of things that I do as, as a scientist. And mainly from the uh, approach of using computers and in this case, high performance computers to design new materials, particularly for renewable energy applications. So as, as you will see from my title there, accelerating, the key thing is to accelerate. How do we speed up these processes? Accelerating advanced energy materials design and discovery via high-performance computing. And uh, just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that I do within my group, as you see there, we are a material heavily driven group and uh, we have some uh, mineral component as well. Uh, the key things that uh, significantly feature in my research, as you will see in team one, there is steam film photovoltaics. And there we are very, very interested in what is happening in team film uh, solar cells. And team film solar cells simply means that you're gonna have a lot of multi-layer structures as you deposit raw material on top of the next material. And the behavior of those interfaces can serve as caveats where things can go wrong. And therefore understanding those interfaces and how to engineer them for specific application becomes very in interesting. Second thing which runs heavily through my group is heterogeneous catalysis design. We are really interested in a lot of catalyst design these days. We really were interested in CO2 conversion. We are really interested in hydrogen evolution, which is a green from water splitting. And therefore there's a need to find out or discover new materials that are conventionally cheaper compared to the uh, platinum based uh, expensive metals. Batteries are becoming a very hot topic and equally runs through a lot of interfacial phenomena happens in batteries. And therefore applying these techniques to understand how battery systems work and why they may fail at certain times becomes also a very key thing of interest to my group. And then the other part where I cannot dive into all other things because these are also relevant to those disciplines is uh, surface geochemistry. And there sometimes we call it computational mineralogy. And there also there's all the interesting things that happens in life happens at surfaces. And therefore it is always interesting to understand how surfaces behave. This, the in, interaction between a surface and something else is where the exciting things are happening. And those are things that computational chemistry can actually help unravel those chemistry. We look at water purification systems. We want absorbers to really pick up uh, pollutants in systems. That is adsorption process. It's gonna happen at the surface or an interface. And those chemistries we really want to unravel as well. And uh, those who are online, those who are here, if you want to know more about the group and what we do, a lot of our research expertise and our publications and things, and the group members, you want to visit our website, uh, Materials and Mineral Theory Group, and there you'll find out more about what is going on within the, the research team. Principally, the key thing that we are after here is structure property performance relationships. So when you take a particular structure, what are the properties of that structure and why does it perform the way it's performing? So it's only very important to understand the structure and therefore determine the properties related to the specific structure. How then is that property and influencing how it performs for all kinds of applications, whether solar cell or catalysis, it's all gonna be driven by structure property. And therefore becomes a very key thing that we want to ascertain using high performance computing. But that brings me to the, uh, the, the, the main team here. We're here, the energy team, we, we all have this massive challenge called a global energy challenge. And sometimes I just necessary that one can look at it in two perspectives. One would be that, okay, we just want sufficient amount of energy to, to meet all our daily demands. But we realize that uh, society is evolving and evolving over time. And we really want to see, is it just all energies or do we really want to do something towards what we call clean energy? And that's a key thing. And these are the caveats and you can see all kinds of uh, movements all over the world trying to say, we want to save the climate. Climate change is happening. Is it, who is a deviant? Do we? run away from him and completely, but that's something I want to point out today that fossil fuels are still gonna be part of our life for a very long time. The key thing is, should we be doing something to minimize our use of it? That's the key thing. So as we talk about renewable energy and we want to transition, this transition is not just an upfront thing that will happen one day. 
it's going to take time. And that will mean that force of forces to be part of our life. But the key thing is we want to reduce our reliance and dependence on them whilst we beef up uh, the, the development of renewable energy technology. So the, that is the reason why we see that generation sufficient supplies of clean energy for the society becomes the key thing that we are all really striving for these days. And that's the challenge to everyone. Even if we want to use a fossil fuel, what do we want to do to reduce its carbon footprint? Those are things that we are driving at. And the reason why everybody talks about the fossil fuel as if it's a deviant who has served us so well over these years and continue to serve us, is just because of the carbon footprint that is produced. Every year, global, huge amount of tons of CO2 are released into the atmosphere. And it is therefore believed that when we take a cumulative sum of all these CO2, they are what is leading to the temperature increases we see around and therefore the negative impact we see. So therefore, that is the reason why we want to do something about this. So Gutierrez, the US Secretary General said, made a statement. He said that it is time to stop burning the planet and start investing in abundant renewable energy all around us. So renewable energy is all around us, but it doesn't mean that we just get it. We need to do something to get it or we need to do something to convert them. And therefore, there's the, therefore the need that we innovate towards zero CO2 emission. We have to innovate towards it. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen today or happen tomorrow. It's, it's an innovation process. So it's not that the main deviant for the CO2 releasing into the atmosphere is going to stop today, but we have to continue to innovate. That means we have to come up with new innovative ways about which we can develop new uh, energy, renewable energy systems. And the key question that comes into play is the greener mix. So we call them green energy, but it's not just one of them is going to serve us well. So it's a greener mix. It's a mixture of the different renewable energy technologies that needs to ramp up in the coming years as we really want to uh, minimize our dependence on carbon-based uh, carbon fuel. So there's, there is the hydro, there is therefore the solar, there is the wind. And these are the things that uh, are catching up attention these days and everybody's striving to see how do we harness these available uh, natural resources to us uh, in order to decrease our reliance and therefore beef them up. If you can achieve these things, the key thing is that the goal is that by 2030, most of our renewable energies will, 65% will come from renewable energy. But that's, it means that there's an ambitious plan needs to be going on now. People need, there's massive investments, government willingness, researchers need to be the fundamental research to systems that uh, we need to convert these systems. But there is a caveat here, as you see from um, Camille the Frog, he says that being green is not easy. Being green, it's always gonna cost, it's not easy being green. Why is it not easy? Because you, there's a lot of things that need to come into play. So when we talk about sustainable energy future, there's a lot of things that will have to come together before we can talk about a sustainability goal or, or achieving the future energy. We talk about the hydro, the wind, the electricity are coming. But you can see that as we do all the renewable energy, the intermittency of them mean we need to start thinking about how do we store this energy when we start to produce them in mass quantity. And therefore battery research become energy storage become a very principal component of the development process as well. This day we want to move to electric vehicles. What are, how are we going to start to carry those energy around? Batteries will be the key role players there. So therefore these renewable energy technologies has to grow by the same time exponentially we need to grow the technologies to be able to store this energy and carry them wherever we want to go. We need our phone to carry energy so that we can use them. My laptop right now is not connected to electricity, but it is already charged because there's a battery in it. So we need more robust and efficient stable batteries to do that. Catalysis is going to play a principal role. We talk about hydrogen now as one of the principal fuels, but we need to split, we need to produce hydrogen in a green way. So currently you produce again hydrogen but maybe from methane, and therefore you still have a lot of carbon footprints. So that is why you can have all kinds of hydrogen production. You have the gray hydrogen, the blue hydrogen, the green hydrogen. But we are really interested in the green because we want to talk everything green. But being green, it's not easy. It means that you need something to be able to be green and to get those things done. So those are all the things, CO2 conversion. Right now, CO2 itself is a problem. But the thing is that we can find catalyst materials that can take the CO2 and convert them to other useful chemicals that are relevant for human nature. So those are the key things that confront us as engineers and as, as scientists. What do we do about them? And materials are going to be at the center of all these things. So when we talk about the renewable energy technology, materials are the cornerstone of them. They, they, they are the engine block that hold all of these things together. So I always pose this problem back that we talk about the energy challenge, but we equally have to talk about materials challenge. Or uh, these days we talk about minerals because minerals are becoming principal components of most of our renewable energy technologies. We need critical minerals, we need lithium, we need cobalt in our lithium batteries. And therefore these minerals are becoming scarce. How do we find ways to get them? And what other innovative ways do we get all these minerals? So you see at the heart of all these renewable energy technologies is gonna be material driven and it's gonna be mineral driven. 
So our fundamental understanding of materials and how to engineer them and how to design them will be a key player as we strive towards achieving this goal. For instance, if you just take a, piece, a basic catalyst design, the key things you want to uh, control is number one, you want to increase your active site on the catalyst surface. And the next thing you want to increase activity of this catalyst. Then you realize that there's a whole lot of things that you confront. If you just take one material, just cut it, you're not going to get the activity. So this day we talk about nanostructuring, where we, we, we synthesize this in, in nanomorphologies and different shapes, and just because we want to increase the active size. But at the same time, you want to think about how do you increase activity? So if you don't just want to get a catalyst that gives you a minute conversion of CO2 to something, you want to increase that intrinsic activity of the catalyst. So you are confronted with a whole complex problem. So the material is there, but we have to engineer them. The topology has to change, the surface has to change, the, the shape has to change. These days we're even combining one material with the next material. That means we can annex the good properties of one and combining with the good properties of another one, we form what we call heterostructure systems or composite materials. And it's becoming a very hot thing, but this is the, uh, the goal that we want to proceed. So you will see that materials, in this case, what we call them advanced material, meaning we want them to do something better than our current estate. They are called advanced material and they are generally very complex. So this complexity is what we are all striving to solve. And you realize that one approach to solve this problem, because anything that is complex simply means that you need multidisciplinarity to be able to solve them. So you can't be able to just approach that holistically just from a pure experimentation. The same way you cannot just approach it purely by computation because we do the computation, we predict this to material, but they need to be synthesized. They need to be uh, made and therefore tested. But the key thing is that when you have a marriage between the two of them, it becomes an exciting adventure. So when you marry, modeling computation to synthetic processes or synthesis experimentation, a whole lot of things can come together. We can understand the fixes of the problem, the chemistry of the problem, and know what are the bottlenecks, why this is failing, why that is not failing. And then holistically, we can come up with new improved catalyst materials and also new functional materials for photovoltaics, for nuclear reactors, for thermoelectrics, and these are the things that we want to do. So this complexity is what is driving the goal. This is just something I wanted to point out to maybe students who are here and other people who might be interested. Science is an evolving field. We've gone through a whole lot of paradigms. So the first paradigm, we were looking at experimentation, pure empirical, a lot of experiment because there we didn't even have understanding of the models that describe systems. So those were the first paradigm where everything was purely empirical science. But then we move into the second uh, paradigm where it became more theoretical because now we understand the physics of problems. And therefore, you can see things like the physical laws, where thermodynamics come in, quantum mechanics come in, statistical mechanics come in. We can then begin to formulate models to understand systems. And then the third paradigm came in when now we have not started to use these models to actually implement, to design materials. And that's when first principles comes in. And a lot of the computational work started and started to move. But right now, we talk about big data science. That's the key thing going on. We hear now artificial intelligence, machine learning. So those are the paradigms that are going. And now right now, we're already in the fourth paradigm. Now we're talking about big data. All these data we call it, how do we use them? How do we even get correlations and things that we can learn from and design new things? So the paradigms are shifting. It means the computation. And you can see the third paradigm and the fourth paradigm are heavily computer driven. And there's a very nice book there that anybody who might want to pick up a little bit on this is called the fourth paradigm, data intensive discovery. It's an amazing piece of book that if you are really interested, you want to, you want to pick and grasp. So the reason why we're interested in computation is because Every new technology before they come from the initial stage to commercialization stage, sometimes can take 50 years. No technologies just become so efficient one day. It takes a whole long of year. The first solar cell fabricated was around 1950s with an efficiency of two, uh, 6%. It took several years for us to better and perfect solar cells. Now we're achieving 21%, 25%, 30%. And these technologies take several years, 40 years and 50 years of span. The question is that, as at those time, we really do not have all these computer abilities to do diagnosis of this system and those materials. What are the different chemistry? Why is it that it's taking so long to move from 6% to get to 30%? But that is something that has changed over the years because computer uh, power has not enabled us to really take the same problem and could be able to solve them even within a year and a two year, a three year span. And therefore the technology map roadmap can dri be driven faster. So when we do theory, which has become the, the basis and foundation to all this, we can even do material synthesis 10 times faster than we used to do without the material diagnosis coming in. Device assembling these days, the physics of those devices, like I told you, interfaces material, we can even diagnose them and say that, no, if you partner this material with this, it's gonna fail, so you don't use it. And therefore, experimentation purely alone will do it first, only to realize that it's not working. 
So you will spend maybe six months to synthesize raw material, another six months to form the heterostructure, six months trying to find out how to assemble the device only to find out that the device to give you 2% efficiency. But theory can then go ahead and propagate through this material already, do the complete diagnosis of the system and tell you that this material, which is one of the components of this device is what is the bottleneck. And we, we may have to find a replacement for it. And that can happen within a month. And therefore we can speed up the process by which we, we make devices. And this is all driven because computer power, processing power has significantly exponentially increased over the years. Some of you might have heard of Morse law, it says that the, 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 the number of transistors or resistors on a chip would double every 24 uh, months. And this is something we are all living. Computer processing power has exponentially increased. It's an exponential growth, it's growing significantly. So these days we have laptops that can process a wide range of processes. It, it doesn't used to be like that. But now we have all this available to us. What do we do with this? capacity, these properties that we have now. And we realize that as the computer processing power is increasing also, performing computational experimentation is implementing, it's decreasing. These days, it's, it's so cheaper to do a lot of things that experiment will give you, but computers can give them to you in a split second. So it becomes much cheaper to do that. So anybody who might be thinking, what is high performance computing? High performance computing simply means it's a cluster or a collection of a separate server. So you have several computers combined together. So they have different processing nodes that we can integrate together. And this ability is what we now want to harness. And these things are typically built into multi-complex structures that typically you don't have to see them, but you can assess them. So as a user, I use a lot of raw machine in Penn State now. I've never know which building it is, but I assess it remotely through my laptop. That's all. All I need to do, that's all I need to do. So but that machine is a complex system, a giant multi-node computer system. And it's sitting there somewhere. All I need is just an internet, my computer, and I can serve into what we call the nodes, the computer nodes. And there will be a wide range of the connected to different capacities of supercomputers exist over the world. So currently, US has the, 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 the number one. So again, you can see that because supercomputers started ranking, they have already developed a metric now to rank them, which one is the best in the world, which one has the highest capacity. And the, here, the, now we talk about the top 500, but I mean top 1,000. And the US still a wide range of the, the top 10 you see maybe US has six out of the 10 in, in, in the best supercomputers in the world. This one here called the Frontier recently became the world number one, but the one in Japan used to be the world number one for several years. So Japan has a massive supercomputer investment. And you can see that governments and every organization is really investing in supercomputers these days. Even individual companies are investing, all the pharmaceutical industries are investing heavily in high performance computers. And the reason is because they have become the main, state, the main part of the research and development process. The European Union has its own base in Finland, amazing supercomputers. And I've, I was fortunate because I was in Europe for a very long time. I had access to most of these machines and could use them. Even still, I still have access to assess them. Here in Penn State, institutions also have their own high performance computers now. And Penn State has its own. So if you want to know more about these hypercomputers, you want to check out what the ICDS is doing. And you have the raw machine, which is serving a wide range of purpose for computer needs and things that conventionally your laptop or desktop won't be able to do. You want to get in touch with them, request an account, and students and staffs, everybody has equal capacity to use them. So what do we really mean by computational material design? That's the key thing I wanted to talk about. So we are basically con concerned about uh, our capability to design theories and methodologies and software to be able to predict properties of materials and design new materials as well. So it can capture both the specific property we are interested in, but the universal properties of the material. And the reason why modeling and simulation become the principal thing we want to do is because we, these are the goals we set up for ourselves. What do we want to achieve? We want to obtain automatic structure of systems. Sometimes it's very difficult to even measure properties of material, depending on all kinds of conditions we're looking at. And this is one of the things that uh, computational materials don't help us to do. We want to understand and identify the microscopic view. Most materials are made up of atoms and electrons. And understanding of these systems at the intricate atomic level becomes the principal thing because when we know them there, we can engineer them. That's the key thing that we want to understand. And we want to complement experiments. Sometimes you do experimentalists. I have a lot of questions all over the world. People will say, we just synthesize this catalyst and this catalyst, and this one gives us a better performance. Why is this one not giving us a better performance? It means that something has happened fundamentally at atomic level. Is it a surface property driven? Is this some atom that has come there, an impurity? What has happened? And we can also help explain experimental observation at the same time, we can also go ahead and make a prediction and tell experiment, can you guys make this? So those, we work hand in hand. That's why it's a beautiful marriage. So we want to discover new materials as well. And there are different wide range of skills that people do computational materials design. 
the segment at which I am more focused or within my research is what we call the atomistic level, the electronic and atomistic level. The key thing is that you can go to the macro scale and the meso scale and all those skills, but the key thing is that the property at the micro scale is always going to be between and detected by the property at the atomic scale. So if the atomic scale behavior is known, we can then use it to control how the macro scale will look like. And that's the key thing that that bridging of gap exists that we, we can go between atomicity to micro and to the macro scale. So there's a wide range of modeling going on. I'm very, very interested in what is happening at atomic level. And because once I know that, I can engineer what will happen at the macro scale. So different people have worked on all kinds of things. Here, I will bug you a little bit, just a little bit. We call something molecular mechanics. So an atom and an atom, we don't care whether it's electron or not, just bond distances and angles. Then we can develop new models. So those in thermodynamics class, we hear about Van der Waal equation of states. Beautiful equation of state, but that equation can give us a wide range of things. We bring atoms close and closer together, they will start to repel each other. So we can just use basic size and distances and develop new models. And we can use them to predict a wide range of properties. So those type of models, we call them molecular mechanics of interatomic potentials. And if you're not really interested about the electronic system, then you can use them. They, but they can do us amazing things. So if you look at here, uh, the crystallization of ion, they could simulate over 1 billion atoms. And to simulate 1 billion atom system is such a complex phenomenon. Electronics won't be able to tell you that. No, electronics won't do that. But because we can just use molecular mechanics where we don't care about electrons, just bonding and distances, we could develop interatomic potentials and simulate a wide range of complex macro scale system. But there we are not really interested in what is happening at atomic or the electronic contribution that is happening, just the segregation. So what those 1000 atoms have been simulated, they see a wide range of segregation, domain formations in these systems. And that's what molecular mechanics can do for you. But in reality, if you look at most of the renewable energy technology we talk about it today, it's not just bond distances. Electrons are going to play a key role. If you talk about batteries, it's all electronic properties. If you talk about solar cell, it's all about citation of electrons. So you cannot just throw away the electrons and just use molecular mechanics. You won't get that phenomenon because it's an excitation problem. So I called some things, I call the two powerful little people who are going to control the dictates energy transition. And they'll play a key role. We call them the electrons and the photons. The photons are going to be coming, uh, energy coming from the sun, radiation. Electrons are when the photon strikes, what it knocks loose. So our understanding of electrons and photons and how the dynamics between the two of them becomes a principal thing, which is why we see them in photonics, electrochemistry, photovoltaics, photochemistry, they become principal things. We want to understand this behavior. So that would mean we have to go to a different type of model, not just molecular mechanics. And that's when quantum mechanics comes in. But I won't bug you a little bit about the details of quantum mechanics, a complex thing on its own. But the key thing is we want to solve a particular Hamiltonian, which we call the Schrodinger equation. That is the master equation. If we can ever solve it, life will be so easy for us. But that equation you see there is very simple, but technically it's just for only one electron system. Most of the, even the highest supercomputers will take you forever to solve them. So therefore, some approximations need to happen. And the breakthrough happened in around 1964 when a guy named Walter Kohn, a physicist, uh, he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry actually, when he developed a, a procedure we call density functional theory. So instead of looking at an electron as a multi-complex many body problem, he now treated all these electrons as if it's a density of the electrons and interacting with the ion, as you see here. So that problem quickly just changed the whole dynamics of materials design. Because now we cannot just use electron density but still produce all the universal properties of the material instead of worrying about solving the individual uh, many body problem. And that become a revolution since then and has been the, the main backbone to most of our material system that we design these days. It has applications in a wide range of fields. I won't go into the details of them, just a few of them, surface science. We may ask, where uh, is the gas molecule attaching on the surface? That's a question. You can use DFT to answer that question in a short time. It is like catalysis. What is the reaction mechanism? What is the activation energy barrier? Those are questions that DFT will still be able to produce uh, answers to. We talk about uh, drug design. Many these days, we don't want drug systems that goes into our body and they just transform into all kinds of things. That's why we have a lot of side effects. So the key thing is there's a lot of screening these days, even where we use all these approaches to design. That's why the uh, drug design system are really going heavy after all these computational approaches as well. So there's a wide range of questions that can be answered using this approach. So today I'll give you a flavor of just two, the, the key one that I do that I work more, but I won't be able to go into all of them. So the first one is computational catalyst design. Catalyst design, we need catalysts. Catalyst in simple term is just, we need their agents that will be able to speed up our rate of reaction. 
So basically, the lower the activation energy barrier for such a process to happen, and therefore we'll be able to cross it over quicker and quicker and quicker and produce more of the products that we want. So therefore, catalyst design is a big thing within the, 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 the green energy technology as well. We want to convert CO2 into formic acid to uh, ethanol to methanol to formaldehyde. These are all chemical synthetic fuels that we need. They, we have a wide range of applications for them. People talk about the methanol economy. It's a green flower. The key thing is, they are going to be, can we use CO2, which is the, 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 the fish stock, a lot? Can we convert them? And hydrogen evolution is a key thing. We want to split hydrogen, but we want to produce it the green way. That is, it has to come from water splitting. You have abundance of water. The question is, can we split water because it has two hydrogens? Can we get more hydrogen from water? And that will be what we call the green hydrogen production. So there's a wide range of things that we want to do in catalyst design. So recently, there was a, a nice piece of work we did some time back where in the angle of hydrogen evolution. So one of the materials that are typically good for hydrogen evolution are the noble metals, platinum, gold, and et cetera. But the question is, are these things sustainable? Are they, can we scale them up? Because platinum is such an expensive metal already. It's, it, we have competition with it for our jewelry and all kinds of things. So the question, can we find more abundant effort materials that can still produce and do similar behavior just as the, the platinum, which are cheaper, we can easily make them. So one of the material system that is of always attraction is molybdenum disulfide. It has a wide range of application, even in the petrochemical industry uh, for, crack, uh, for, for the cracking process. So it's a massive good catalyst. But for hydrogen evolution, this particular catalyst uh, has two phases of polymorph or even three or four uh, polymorphs of it. We have something called a 2H phase and a 1T phase. The 1T phase tends to be a very active catalyst for hydrogen evolution, but by itself it's unstable. Therefore, it has to be stabilized. And therefore, they use a lot of lithium, lithium in stabilizing this uh, catalyst material. The question is, is the lithium just there as a spectator or the lithium is also contributing to some catalytic activity of that MOS2? That question has been eluded in, in the field for a very long time. There were all kinds of things where that or maybe it's just there observing. But you know that the guy is there, so he's not just observing, he's doing something. So we, we set out to unravel that chemistry to see, is he really observing or participating? So that's what we call this, uh, this particular paper we published in ACS uh, back in 2019, unraveling the role of lithium in the hydrogen evolution activity of that catalyst. One of the key things that we found, which is just a summary I want to give as a snapshot, is these materials can be made. And we can make them by introducing different compositions of the lithium. So we can tune the composition, the amount of lithium we introduce to stabilize the material. So the question is, if you have low lithium loading or high lithium loading or a sex of lithium loading, what, what do we gain from that? One of the key things that uh, a model we do, which this model uh, where we build myself and other people who work with myself in Cardiff, uh, we were able to also mimic the same system, model this material system, introduce a wide different composition of the lithium, and then see what is the lithium doing. So the first thing we found out for sure is that when you introduce the lithium, lithium comes with a charge uh, of plus one. Most often it lose, it gives all of that charge to the, the MOS2. So the MOS2 become heavily electron rich electron density. So it tunes, first thing it does, it, it tunes the electronic density of the, the catalyst. And that electron density tuning will affect how hydrogen attaches to the catalyst. Evolution simply means that you split one hydrogen, it will stay on the catalyst surface, you split another one, it will stay there. They need to migrate and combine and evolve hydrogen. That is the whole process of hydrogen evolution. So if your hydrogen stick to the catalyst surface too strongly, it's never going to diffuse. The other one will stay there. So they will end up rather poisoning the catalyst. So you don't want a binding energy that is too strong but it should be stable enough to hold it so that it can just diffuse, combine, and evolve hydrogen. That's what we want to do. That's why when you do hydrogen evolution, you see bubbles coming. The bubbles simply mean hydrogen is evolving. That's, that's the whole thing that's happening. So we need catalyst material that will not bind these hydrogens when they split too strongly. What we found out is that at low lithium loading, you see that the binding energies, which is around close to zero. So typically, we want the binding energy, we call it the Gibbs-free energy. It should be as close as possible to zero. And that's, we mean that they will be facile enough to diffuse over the catalyst surface and therefore see themselves combine, give us the hydrogen we want. So, but if you go to high lithium loading, you can see that Gibbs free energies could go over even 1.0 uh, EV, electron volts. Those are high energy. It means that the hydrogen is sticking too strongly to the catalyst when you have loaded it with too much lithium because the lithium is populating that. So that would tend to give you less production of hydrogen. And that is exactly, what we model this system and then transfer this knowledge to say that no. Models tell us that if we make this material with just low lithium loading, we should be able to produce more hydrogen. And that's exactly what is happening in, in the experiment as well. As you see here, you see that at low lithium loading, the red curve you see here, we call them the turnover frequency. And those, those are how my basically they take a, 
the amount of reproducing normalized by the number of active sites on the cutley surface, we can then see how much we produce. And you see that at low lithium loading, that's what experiment observe. So again, this marriage where we could go ahead and even model a system and just say that when we tune that, so one thing you will learn straight away is that the, the lithium is not, not just there necessarily as a spectator. It has contributed something to the catalytic activity of the catalyst. And that is the thing that quickly inform experiment. And therefore, when they go, the wind synthesis now throwing a lot of lithium into, into the stabilization of that MOS2 system. And the next catalysis team I talk about is CO2 activation. CO2 is such a very stubborn gas. The reason why it's such a stubborn gas is because it is a highly stable and inert gas. That's why we tend to have it stay in the f crust for a very, very long time. It just doesn't like reacting with anything. So it's a very, and that is the main reason why we have a lot of it in the atmosphere. So the reason, the thing there is, can we find catalysts, materials that will be able to activate it? Activate it simply means, can we find material system that it can react with? Because until we can react it, we can convert it. That's the key thing. If you can't react CO2 and activate it, you can never convert it to, it, it to anything else. So the activation is, a, is always the primary step, the key step that we need in any activation or catalytic conversion of CO2. So what we want to do is that we want to get our CO2 to be able to anchor on the catalyst surface, absorb on the catalyst surface. It to change from being a linear molecule. It's a linear molecule. When it gets activated, it will form a bent species. The bending of the species simply means it has peak electron from the catalyst surface and therefore it will lose the linearity and now become interested in loose stability. Now it's interested to pick anything that comes around. And therefore, if hydrogen is around, that CO2 can pick hydrogen and turn them into formic acid and turn them into ethanol and turn them to all kinds of things that we're interested in. But the question is, which materials would do that for us? That's why it's a material problem. So there was some work we did some time back. Um, there's a hypothesis that says that minerals play a, a principal role in the origin of life theory. And iron sulfides are believed to be one of the key guys uh, who play the principal role. So we, we, we set out to biomimic this system because there is a natural enzyme called the carbon mono, uh, mono, monoxide dehydrogenase. It's a natural enzyme, but this enzyme can actually split CO2 easily. So the question is, can we find some mineral system that have similar constituents, iron, sulfur, possibly nickel and other impurities in them? That is called biomimic. We want to biomimic these systems. So the interest is that there's something we call the prebiotic chemistry in hydrothermal veins. These are things that happen in the deep ocean floors where iron sulfide is one of the commonest minerals you'll find on Earth, on, on the meteorites, on Earth, on, under the oceans, they are everywhere. So if we can harness them, that means that we have abundance of it. So it won't be a problem to make them or find them. So one of the key elements there was Makinawa. We have something we call the gray guy, those in the mineral people, I'm sure Babs will know a lot about those minerals. Pyrite, which were one of my favorites as well. We, we set out to look at one of the, the key guys called Makina White. Makina White, as you see here, is a layer structure. So it forms a lot, a lot of layers and it's stacked together, held by Van der Waal interactions. So Van der Waal from thermodynamics again, play a key role in holding even layer structures together. So we could, we could create surfaces of this material catalytically to say, okay, which facet, which even surface of this material will react to the CO2? Again, that's when shape modification and shape modulation become a principal thing in catalysis. So if you look at different surfaces of the material, you can find what we call stable surfaces and less stable surfaces. And that would depend on how much energy it would cost you to be able to cleave the material along those crystallographic planes. So if you cleave just the Van der Waal bond, because there's no bond there, you're just cutting through the material, just weak bond, there's no bond. So it will cost you less energy to do that. So you see that a 001 surface tends to be the most stable for that particular layer system. Whilst as you go to other ones, you have to cut bonds, the energy will cost you more penalty to be able to create those things. So we can then simulate morphology, even how use those crystallographic information and simulate how the nanoparticles of this material will look at just from computation. And therefore tells us, oh, this surface is gonna be more prominent in the nanoparticle. Can we do something to modulate that shape if we want more of the other facets to be appearing? Those are all things that we, we tend to be able to unravel. So if you take that CO2 molecule, the most stable surface 001, in the left corner there, if you throw in CO2 that surface, it just kick it away. CO2 just repel. And the basic question will be, why is it repelling? You can see that surface is saturated with sulfur. Sulfur is a negatively charged species. Because it's negatively charged, when the CO2 is coming, the oxygens are negative, this oxygen is also negative. A lot of two negatives will repel each other. So just kick it away, no attraction. And generally it's a behavior of CO2. It doesn't just like reacting. But does it mean that catalyst is not good? Can we even engineer the catalyst? We could just introduce what we call vacancies, defect chemistry. So defect chemistry is a big umbrella within catalysis these days. We are next just to even improve the activity of catalysts. 
So just by taking one sulfur away, which is also prevalent, the formation energy of sulfur on this material system is 0.02, very, very small. That means that you will naturally see a lot of vacancies on this catalyst surface. And as soon as you take one sulfur away, the catalyst picked the CO2 straight away and activated it. Therefore, that CO2 now becomes an activated species and can be converted. And those are the things that we really want to, we want to be doing. So just by knowing that, oh, what is the perfect surface, sulfur saturation, nothing will happen. We, we can just engineer it. So therefore, we can just tell the experimental guys that, you know what, under different pressure pressures, you could just induce the catalyst so that you introduce what we call defect chemistry. Your catalyst will become very active. Those are the things that we, so if we do that with that experiment knowing, they will have gone and synthesized the perfect crystals and only to realize that nothing is happening. And why is nothing happening? Just by a tweak, we said, no, you could do that and that will happen. So that is the chemistry. You see the electronics we could do. You see the two electron class pushing the sulfur away. But in the other case, they will anchor it because now the two ions are exposed, which are cations. So they will draw the oxygen to themselves. But if you go to other surfaces, they will attract itself straight away. So it means that different facets of different catalysts have different catalytic activities. That's why we come to what we call shape modification. So if you look at the nano shape of that material, you see the 001 there, it's the one that has the largest surface area, but it is also the less active surface. It is only the corners, the edges, which are active. So the question is, can we now propose mechanisms by which we can synthesize the nanoparticle such that we can, we can extend the edges and shrink the basal plane? These are all things that are happening. And there was a beautiful piece of work I do with, so we call them organic functionalization. You functionalize the surface of those nanoparticles and you can, uh, we can modulate that shape and, and bring more of the active surface and decrease more of the less active surface. And those are all things that uh, modeling is helping us to do these days. So a more interesting piece of work, and we can look at different reaction mechanisms, how this uh, CO2 can react with water in the presence of hydrogens and therefore reduces even to a CO molecule. CO molecule become a principal uh, ingredient for methanol formation. So just by reacting, we can reduce that CO2 now into a carbon monoxide. That carbon monoxide become a fixed store to pick two hydrogen or three hydrogen and we form a, a, a methanol. So those are the exciting things that are happening in the angle of catalysis. And just a brief thing I will talk about in terms of PV system. So the next thing I talk about is uh, photovoltaics. So photovoltaics is gonna be, it's currently is one of the cheapest forms of energy as well. It's already very, very cheap. Cost of production of uh, solar panels have drastically implemented over the years. And now it's competing with, with the wind and the nuclear in terms of cost per hour that we, we buy. But that is because there's been massive advances in, in silicon-based uh, solar cells. But again, you will see that we don't have a lot of, not every roof as we see has solar panels over them. So even though we talk about the cost being reduced, Silicon itself, the production of silicon is such an intensive energy process. Silicon is because we have to purify silicon dioxide and that process is a high temperature process. So the, a lot of costs go into just making this, the purely crystalline silicon. So the question is, can we find other innovative effort abundant materials that would do a similar job? So that we move from energy, you want to produce energy, but you have to give a lot of energy to even get what you want to get. Can we minimize that? So that is when it comes that we want to find new materials. And uh, one of the hottest materials in the, in, in the domain when we talk about solar cells is that we call them the perovskite materials. Uh, they are becoming so attractive because within a span of 10 years, we've moved their efficiency from 3% to already at performing silicon. But they have a, an interesting inherent property, the problem. The problem is that they are highly unstable. So the key thing is that we want to produce materials that will still last us. We want a solar panel that will last for 25 years, 20 years. We don't want to produce a solar panel that will break down in one year. So though this material has achieved massive efficiency over a short period of time, the inherent instability problem still poses massive questions for material scientists to resolve. Until we can resolve that, and if we can, I'm sure there will be solar panels all over everywhere because they are printable. We could just print them into even cloth and we print them into our roofs and everywhere we are converting energy. You wear thin film uh, clothes and you are walking and you are charging your phone, but until we stabilize them. So that's a, it's a big question going on. And we have this uh, golden rule, the cost, the lifetime and efficiency. So your efficiency can be so good, your cost can still be good, but your lifetime is terrible. So therefore there is a bottom problem. So we want to keep harnessing these three golden triangle. That's the key thing we want to do. And a wide range of materials of interest these days. So the reason why we talk about those interfaces, as I showed in the beginning slide, is we have thin films have a lot of materials we deposit on top of the next material, et cetera. So understanding the interfaces is the key thing. And the primary material is what we call the absorber material. So the absorber is the solar cell material, which is sandwiched between all kinds of host material. 
So we have something we call the electron extraction uh, layer and the hole extraction layer. These are things we deposit. So you shine your light on the absorber, it produces electron hole pairs. But they don't stay there. If they stay there, you would never get electricity. We have to be able to collect that electron before it recombines. So the key thing is that we partner what we call electron transport layer, the whole transport layer, so that those ones can pick the electron as and when we, we generate them. So it means that the interface where those electrons have to pass and the holes have to pass to get to the other material becomes a key thing. If there's a problem there, you can generate as much electron as you want, but you will never be able to collect them. So if there's a huge defect chemistry in the interface, you will excite by the defect will hold the electron and therefore you will be able to collect them and produce electrical current. So interface engineering is a big thing within the, the two team solar cells now. And this is where materials modeling and simulations is playing a principal role. The reason being that interfaces are things that are buried on top of the next one. So they're sandwich. Most of our experimental probes can probe surfaces, but they need to penetrate the material and go all the way to the interface to be able to probe. And a lot of the institute approaches are struggling with that. But that's why modeling comes in to complement experiment to provide a missing gap, things that you couldn't access by yourself, modeling can complement you to, to bring that into, into light. So those are things that we, we really want to understand. If your interface is bad, you will excite by the trap will trap them. And then when you bring one material on top of the next material, they form what we call band alignment because a semiconductor and another semiconductor, they don't have the same band gap. So they will, they will form something we call band alignment. If it's a single material, gravitational uh, force tells us that when you jump, do you stay up there or you drop? You drop because gravitational force will pull you down. The same thing happens in semiconductors. So when we excite the electrons from the valence band into the conduction band, the hole is a positively charged species. The electron is negatively charged. Columbic attraction is there already pulling him down, but gravity will tell you that you've got to come down. So you can excite the electron by to fall down again and recombine. And if you have a massive recombination, you have no current. That's the key thing. So our goal in solar cell is to minimize recombination. That will mean that that's why we even want to partner one material with the next material. So that as soon as we excite the electron, the other guy can collect it before it even thinks of recombining. That's the whole essence of solar cell. So which materials do we partner with? What kind of junctions, barriers do this electron have to cross from where it reached to get to the other material? If the barrier is too high, the electron will still stay there because it couldn't cross over. Therefore, the only place it can go is to fall back to where it came from. That's recombination. So uh, there's a whole lot of device physics and chemistry going on. And we really want to bring modeling to unravel them. So there's a nice piece of work we did some few months back. And we look at mac uh, macasite and pyrite. Again, I said, I love the sulfides. Uh, these were interested for, for solar cells. Well. They have a sighting band gaps, but the macasite phase was thought to have a very low band gap. So everybody wants to remove macasite from uh, pyrite films because they thought if it has a low band gap, then if it goes into it, it would destroy the solar cell. And then we, I revisited this problem some time back in 2016, just to see, is this really hypothesis true? So there was a paper that was published in the 80, 1980s. And that paper has been cited over 2,000, 5,000, 6,000 times. But again, the question is just as science evolved, we have new techniques, new approaches to really recharacterize material. So as at that time, they just used some uh, resistivity measurements to characterize the uh, band gap of macasite, And they thought it's 0.34. But it turned out to be that that is not true. So that has misled the field for a very long time. A lot of effort were there to remove that macasite from pyrite. So when I revisited, we modeled this system and you can see that both of them are still semiconductors, but the macasite actually even have a higher band gap than the pyrite. So it means that if it goes into the, 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 the pyrite, it's not going to be detrimental to it. It should rather help the band gap process so that excitation happens. Most, there's something we call a quasi limit of most semiconductors. Band gaps within 1.1 to 1.4 are the best we want for solar cell. And there's a whole physics to it, which I won't be able to cover to you today. So it means that if macasite goes, it's not going to be detrimental. And therefore, quickly, I call upon my experimental colleagues that no, this, this could be a sighting. So it means that when you synthesize them and they are mixed together, they form what we call heterojunction, they form junctions. The question is, what kind of junction even exists between them? Do they have high barriers, low barriers, so that when we excite the electron, we can collect them? And we do this modeling and the key thing we, can, we speculate or we find out is that yes, they form what we call a type two band alignment, which is what we want for solar cell. So that your electrons are going to one phase and the holes are going to the other phase. That means you are minimizing how they will even see themselves. They won't see themselves anymore. And that's exactly what happened in the macasite fields. So my colleagues by then in ATU uh, and over in the Netherlands were able to make different compositions of this material and just tested their photocatalytic response or the photo response of this material. And the key thing, the conclusion is that you can see that when you just have mixed components system, well-modulated, 
the photo response astronomically just go high compared to when you have a pure phase, which is far, far low below the uh, in the green. So it just simply means by engineering the material to form properly aligned in junctions can even influence the rate at which you collect your electrons. And therefore your photo response will be astronomically very high. And one of the systems we're looking at now, just to give a snapshot of some other exciting things happening. We call something the perovskite has told you. I am not looking at the conventional one, we call them the halide perovskite. I'm looking at what we call the all inorganic perovskites. And these days we're looking at what we call charcogenous perovskite. The problem about the all in, uh, the halide perovskite is that they are too unstable. Their, their efficiency is too good, but their stability is too bad. So we need to find alternatives, other materials that will have some chemical robustness, stability is a key thing we want to do. So the all inorganic become an exciting one. And uh, we could just take that material and even begin to dope it. Doping simply means you introduce a foreign entity into the material and see how it changes the property of the material. Is it for the good direction or the negative direction? And that's what we could do and just stabilize. How does it we stabilize the material? Does it increase the cohesiveness of the material so that it will prevent it from breaking down? And that's what we found that we could dope this material with uranium and indium. And we see that they improve the stability of the material and the electronics are excitingly good. So these materials were then uh, proposed, my colleagues in uh, South Korea, in West of Konam, were able to synthesize this material and introduce those particular dopants in them. And the key thing we found out from here, you can see that as a highlight here, as a high lot is that uh, if you have nothing within it, your efficiency is about 12%. If you just dope with a little bit of uranium, you get your efficiency 13.72, and even with indium, 15.72. The same way your stability also improves. The pure material has a stability over several hours of testing, to 60%. That means after 1,000 hours, you will lose already 60% of the efficiency. But then if you introduce those elements, you could retain your efficiency beyond 87 and 75 respectively for those systems. So just by defect uh, doping chemistry, we can also improve the stability of materials. And we did a similar work for a terbium. So we just introduced, because once you learn one thing you want to try, that's the beauty about computational material science is that we can expand the parameter space. We can introduce what we want to do to change the chemistry of the material. So we know this is working. What, what about this one? And this also turned out to be even amazingly good. We could take the efficiency even to 17%, from the 13 to 17. And then we could even do go further. As they make these materials, they have polymorphs, alpha phase, beta phase. But from experience, I realized that if you couple different materials well engineered, we can even create these junctions, which can efficiently collect our electrons. So this material has a alpha phase and a gamma phase. So when they synthesize them, you see them form those junctions, domains. That's, those are highly resolution TM images of those nanopart materials. Junctions are formed. Those are the junctions we want to understand from modeling. What is the nature of those junctions? Are the defects there? Are they perfectly crystalline? And that's what we could model. And that's what uh, we did recently. Uh, we, we look at those interface region and you can see here how the interface is formed, a very perfect interface. And you see electron density accumulation there simply means that the, the interface is stable because you don't want to form an interface so that within a short testing, the interface fall apart. If you fall apart, then you never achieve the same thing. You go back to the isolated material. So stability in the interface is very important. Uh, we do a whole lot of things. The key thing I wanted to say is that just by doing that, we could take the efficiency to 22% or 21 point something percent. And this is something that's currently uh, uh, under a review in the Journal of Science. It's a very, it's one of the highest efficiency so far seen for this type of systems, just by modulating those systems. And now, just to highlight again, we are now going even a deeper further using machine learning to probe these interfaces because the interface can rotate. So the degrees of freedom is very high, but machine learning cannot help us to probe the configurational space of this material, find out which geometry is even gonna give us the most stable interface. And this is what we, we, we're doing in our group recently. And one of my PhD students, is Henry, is uh, looking a lot more into such systems. And one of my students is looking at batteries, which I don't want to talk about because it's not one of the key highlights, but I just want to let you know that there's a lot of exciting things happening in the group as well. Well, we are developing a new system we call lithium sulfur batteries. One of my PhD students, he's in class now, Ricardo, is looking extensively in lithium sulfur batteries as rival to lithium ion battery. The problem with the lithium ion batteries is that we have cobalt, the nickel there, and they're becoming scarce commodity. So can we use a naturally more abundant sulfur as a cathode material? And that is more cheaper. So if we can get it to work, that's soft. The, 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 the challenge of cost. Geochemistry, those might be interested in mineral separation. This is all surface chemistry. So if you want to catch up with my students sometime, or you want to speak with myself, you have issues about selectivity of reagents and ligands to, to pick up a particular mineral from a, a garage. Those are things that we can unravel as well. And uh, that is where I want to pause and say that the take home message I just want to say is that 
if we have the marriage between experiment and modeling, a whole lot of beautiful things can happen. One, we can do what we call materials by design. It means that we design it the way we want it. So we can control it, but it's just by design. And then the next thing you gain from this is you can expand the parameter space, which conventionally you won't be able to do purely by experiment. So expanding our parameter space become a principal thing. And that gives us that degree of freedom from materials design. And this work has been done with a wide host of people all across the world. And I just want to acknowledge them and thank my current students who are looking uh, into uh, extending this piece of work into even no more novel materials, funding and agencies, mainly spend most of my time in the UK and Europe. So came from Europe, I'm here now. So hopefully more, more will start propping up from, from the, the US system. And I just want to conclude by this statement that the real voyage of discovery, if we want to discover new things sometime, we don't necessarily just have to go be looking for new lines. We just need to see with a new eye. And hopefully these days materials modeling and high performance computing becomes the new eye to see things that purely experiment won't be able to see. And with that, I want to say thank you. Yep. Question. So, um, yeah, towards the end, you mentioned expanding the parameter space. Yep. So this is your, um, yep. Mm -hmm. I guess what's the dimensionality of that parameter space? Okay, so yeah. optimal, optimal, yeah. configurations or optimal materials. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so the parameter space simply means that, so one, we can look at what we call nanostructure. So you, you look at can even if I couple this material through this facet and this other facet, the property will completely be different from if I combine a different facet with another facet of the same material. So what modeling helps you to do is that because we can do that at no cost, we could screen all the possible facets of a material as you nanostructure the material. And that's what we mean by the parameter space there. And we could then do that and also be able to predict the new structure that the composite will have. The second thing, as you see from the doping work, Purely experiments, you will start off by saying, okay, let's just put the nickel there. And then you do it and realize that at the end of the day, the nickel was very de detrimental to the solar system. It killed it. So what we do from a computation, why the computation becomes such a relevant component to be integrated in the experiment is that we go ahead, we, we screen a wide range of possible dopants into the material. We will be able to come up with a, a convolution complex and say that, when you do this, this material will give you this kind of behavior. We'll find out the optimum, the one that is giving you the optimal property because we have a property in mind we are looking for, which we need to tune that property together. So parameter space screening becomes very easy with computation because we could just screen even a thousand elements, with, you know, not necessarily a thousand in this case, maybe 10, 15, within a week. And I come back to you and tell you that, uh-oh, if you look at just this range, this one and this one, they are the most promising. So you don't waste that time just starting from something that we even give you the less because you don't know. That's basically an experiment you go in as a black box because you just throw in things, you don't know what it is. But what we do is we engineer it, that's what we call it materials design. So even though we are spanning the parameter space because we have a degree of freedom to do so at not necessarily much cost, we could do that. Yeah. And there's a, a whole lot of other things that we could talk about the material, the, the expansion of the parameter space. Babs will tell you that in the mineral processing, sometimes they want to pick up gold or they want to pick up nickel, but then you have all kinds of ligands. Which type of ligands or which kind of functional groups we even pick a particular ligand? If you go in blindly, sometimes you will say, okay, let's try this one, let's try this one. So you do what we call serendipity. You're just trying things at random. But what we do is that, yes, we can screen the same thing even though it looks serendipity, but what end up is that we are able to predict to minimize the try and error approach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's a very good question. Yeah, we predict, that's why it's called first principle. First principle simply means starting from the scratch. That's the meaning of first principle. You start from the scratch. So you don't necessarily need an experiment to do anything. You could, we call, we have what people are working on only structure prediction. So they can design new polymorphic, different material that even experiment has never synthesized yet. But then they explore all the configurational space of that material and find out even there are even some materials which we haven't explored yet and they are even more stable than what we thought is the most stable. And therefore we could then, what conditions would that form? What chemical potential would that form? You go to the lab and introduce that condition and you will be able to form them. But by yourself, you will never have thought that they were going to be feasible. So yeah, we can, we can, that's why it's called first principle. 
study from scratch. Yes. Yes. That's a very good question, yeah. So where you will use the cat is gonna be dependent on where you wanna put. So in these days you can have, that, there's a lot of work going on already. We have massive production from methanol as you go to Japan and China. They have already chemical plants that are already converting, forming methanol, ethylene. We use all this formic acid. They're already chemicals we use in our day to day uh, uh, applications. So they're already industries which are taking massive advantage of it. So the thing is whether you want to put them and even in our car engines, we have carbon monoxide as well and O2, the NOx system, these are all catalysts. So if you go into the exhaust chamber, they have all these planted there, you don't see them, but they are there. So as your exhaust is coming out, most of this is already reducing them to the non-toxic form. And, and, and all this, because they become so toxic and carcinogenic to our health, there's a lot of environmental litigation of all these things, and the amount we want to introduce the environment to be as least as possible. So it can be plant wherever you want to plant it, depending on where you want to move like. Yes, Bob. So, a lot of concerns. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So, how do you make a defect yeah. work for the Yes. The defects, as I said, there are defects that can be bad, and there are defects that can be good. So that's a question we try to answer. So we, we have something called killer defects, and there are things that can enhance. So in the case I showed you that catalyst surface when it's covered completely with sulfur, it's a sulfur saturated surface, it will repel the CO2. So in that case, the perfect crystal will never react to the CO2. So it will not be a good catalyst. But that same catalyst, because we know most of our ion sulfur minerals have sulfur vacancies. It can be those natural defects inherent in that. Because the formation energy of just removing the sulfur is such a low thing. So it will form. Sometimes you can even have iron vacancy. It takes more energy to remove an iron than the sulfur in both iron sulfur. So you will have higher tendency to have more sulfur vacancies than iron vacancy. Because the ions are strongly covalently bond, metallic bonding forms within themselves. So what happened in that case is that we saw that just by removing one sulfur, it became a good catalyst. So in that case, it's doing something good. It's not killing the system. But when you go into solar cells, some of those defects can be dangerous. So we have what we call shallow defects and deep defects. Some of those defects, so you have a gap within the material. If you create a vacancy, what it does sometimes it will introduce a state within the middle of the gap. So what happens is that you assign the electron, but instead of the electron getting all the way to the conduction bar so that you can collect it, that defect is hanging in, in the middle there. You throw the electron and just hold it. You throw the electron and just hold it. So what you do is that you generate a lot of electrons, but you're never going to collect them. So it kills the electron in that point. So such a defect would be a killer one. We don't want that one. But that is the whole essence of why modeling comes in. If you start in from the black box, you don't really know. Is it going to kill it? Is it going to enhance it? So we then can introduce all these different geometries into a material system. We can create and even calculate the, the energetics of their formation. Which one is more stable? Which one is most likely to form? Because in situ wise, you aren't able to tell. But we were able to tell that and tell you that if you see this material under this chemical potential condition, you are more likely to introduce more sulfur defects. But we found out that this sulfur defect actually will be something good for what we want. So it's always about the intended purpose. What do you want to use it for? So depending on the use, it can become bad or it can become good. Yeah. Exactly. Like I told you, so there was a nice piece I uh, had a chat with you some time back. So pyrite tends to come sometime with gold. And you said you have a phantom system that has gold in it. Amazingly, you just throw in a little bit of gold into pyrite, we can even engineer the boundary. So just by doping that material with a little bit of gold, we can change the boundary from 0 0.96, which is a little bit too low for optimum solar cell application, which is also one of the reasons why pyrite has been prophesied to be one of the messiah for solar cells, but has so far not achieved its dream. But then you just dope a little bit of gold, you take the boundary up to 1.12, 1.2. Which is now falling into the optimal range and therefore can be become a good thing for solar cells. 
So depending on whatever category you introduce there, we will be able to tell what property are we interested in and is it taking us towards that property or deviating away from that property? That's the whole thing. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, we can have that sometimes. And the reason why sometimes the differences will, will, will pop, will, be, will emerge is depending on the level at which you set up the theory. So I always say that models are always like jackets. You can wear one jacket, you can wear two jackets, depending on the severity of the cold, you can wear another jacket just to insulate yourself. So you can start from the fundamental theory or level of modeling, and therefore your results will disagree with what experiment is, is doing. It simply means you did not factor in the experimental conditions into the model. So if you know that, like for instance, a material has van der Waal interaction to hold the layers together. You come up with a model and you did not account for van der Waal interaction. What will happen is that when you model that system, the layers will fall apart because the only thing holding them together is the van der Waal. So if you don't account for van der Waal interaction, you aren't gonna get the layers stuck together. Other things that caveats typically there, sometimes we call them the bang up, like bang up of semiconductor. The, the simplest of model will never give you the bang up correctly. They will deviate completely from ex ex experiment. So therefore we have another layer we have to wear for that ja jacket. So that the more layers you wear for the model, the more sophisticated it becomes, and therefore the more expensive it becomes. Expensiveness simply means that if it take you one day to run that on a high performance computer, this time it may take you one week. That is how we call it expensive. So yes, there are times where there will be differences just because of factors that govern one experiment hasn't been accounted for in a model and therefore there'll be differences in results. Yeah. Absolutely. I've had a lot of that. So back in the UK, all undergraduate students have a thesis component. So they all do projects. So they have a, sem a whole semester dedicated to projects. And I had a lot of students who love modeling because it just entices them. And I just even had a summer student, right? He, he did. So he spent just about four weeks or eight weeks with me. And we already done generated wiring. He learned the, the, the rudiments of performing these experiments computationally, generated a wide range of data. We just even catching up with the last bits of data and that will be transformed into a manuscript. So yes, these are feasible. And uh, because the, the, the framework is very well established, the key thing is just learning the basic rudiments of how to implement them. And once you introduce us to design simple projects that bachelor students want to pick up on, they will enjoy it and they will love to, 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 to see those things at atomic level. They know this is CO2, but they want to see it as CO2. And they see it just like, oh, this is magical. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yes. Uh, basic is just be a lover to be somebody who wants to look at a screen. That's the first, that's the first kind of requirement. You should be somebody who, generally I came from a background of mathematics, so I'm not a wet chemist. I, so you won't want to put me in a wet chemistry lab. That's not where I want to be because I love mathematics. I love models. So I love to see in front of the computer and generate all these numerical things. So a student who has desire just to play with, with, with things on the computer, design graphics, uh, that's the starting point. It's a curiosity. Science is all about curiosity and the desire to be spending that time there. And then you come in, the basic nesting is just to know, oh, there's gonna be a little bit of quantum mechanics. You don't, need to, you don't need to know whole quantum mechanics to do these kind of simulations. You just need to know where those equations came from, what is relevant to the type of system you wanna work on, and those students are ready to go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.